What do you think of when you imagine something that is controversial? Something that defies social norms? Or something that makes you uncomfortable? Or even something that is immoral in its very nature? Almost all of these descriptions could and would be used to describe the film that Jerry Lewis would create in 1971. But let's take a step back for a second. The 1970s, for film in particular, was a very interesting time. A time of change, and a time of breaking outside of the standards and parameters that held the film industry since its inception. Film was no longer just a form of entertainment. It was truly art, where the creators now had the freedoms and ability to express their thoughts, feelings, and emotions through the productions of their films. A lot of trends were broken during this time, and a lot of genres were also created in response to changes in not only the culture of modern society, but also the film and entertainment industry. And amidst all these revolutionary pictures and iconic directors who would come about during this period, there was a man named Jerry Lewis, and a film so controversial, so universally despised, it has been voluntarily lost since it was made in 1972 and has been unreleased for almost 50 years. But all of that is going to change soon. This is the story of The Day the Clown Cried. So what was this film exactly? Well, The Day the Clown Cried was about the life of a circus clown by the name of Helmut Dork, who was played by Lewis himself, who during a drunken rant ends up mocking Adolf Hitler, which ends with the clown being captured and sent to a Nazi concentration camp. But what happened next is what truly baffled test audiences of the production. During the course of the film, Helmut the Clown would use his tricks as a clown to earn the trust of the Jewish prisoners and would lead them into the gas chambers while seemingly trying to make them laugh. Understandably, the mere idea of this film didn't go over well, especially for the time it was made. In fact, before the film even began production, it was already receiving quite a bit of backlash in trying to tackle such dark subject matter in a comedic way, even going as far as to have a comedic actor portray the main character, who was mostly known at the time for his over-the-top comic roles in films. It seems in more ways than one, the project was always doomed to fail. But of course, that's not where the story ends. Not by a lot. The start of this film really began 10 years before official shooting and production would commence. In 1962, an original script for The Day the Clown Cried was written by actress Joan O'Brien, who co-starred with Jerry Lewis on multiple projects. Lewis himself was personally touched by the script and premise, and even viewed it as an opportunity for himself as an actor to show his other talents, that he could take on a more dramatic and serious role. Over time, he became somewhat obsessed with making the project, and even as years and even a decade went by, he was still eager to create the film. Although he would eventually morph and change the entire story from the ground up before it was put into official production, going as far as to even rewrite the entire script himself. Some call it a vanity project, while some others might just call it his passion project. But regardless, Lewis was set on making this movie and nothing was going to stop him. And with the cooperation of a movie producer named Nathan Waksberger, production began and it was a rough development. There were many creative differences that took place between the two during the production, with Lewis himself having a very controlling role over almost all aspects of production. But one of the biggest problems they faced was the budget, because the film took much longer than anticipated to complete, and they ran out of funds before they had even finished shooting their scenes. And with no other options available, Lewis himself was forced to fund the project with his own money. Of course, that was nowhere near the end of the issues that plagued development. In fact, at some point there was a dramatic argument and disagreement between Lewis and Waksberger, because Waksberger had actually failed to acquire the rights to the original script written by Joan O'Brien. 
and fearing the film may be lost forever, Lewis took a rough copy of the film that they had. However, Waksberger took the original negatives from the film shoots and actually planned on finishing the film himself without the collaboration of Lewis. However, as years went by, there was no word of further development from Waksberger. But unbeknownst to him, by 1973, Lewis confirmed that his version of the film was almost complete and he had been working on it these last few years, even stating that he had been invited to Cannes Film Festival to showcase the completed film. However, this plan would never come to fruition, because O'Brien did not like the changes that Lewis had made to her script, and so refused to allow Lewis to publish it. At this point, many people were already becoming interested in the film. How bad could it really be, and why can't we see it? This type of growing interest and mystique surrounding the film only compounded over time, as more details about the production would come forward. But it wasn't until 1979 that we really got our first look into what truly went on in the film. During this time, fellow comedian Harry Shearer was able to watch a rough cut of the film, and would later go on to describe it on Spy Magazine. He described it as such. Quote, with most of these kinds of things, you find that the anticipation, or the concept, is better than the thing itself. But seeing this film was really awe-inspiring, in that you are rarely in the presence of a perfect object. This was a perfect object. This movie is so drastically wrong, its pathos and its comedy are so wildly misplaced, that you could not, in your fantasy of what it might be like, improve on what it really is. Oh my god. That's all you can say. It's as if you flew down to Tijuana and suddenly saw a painting on black velvet of Auschwitz. You just think, my god, wait a minute, it's not funny, and it's not good. And somebody's trying too hard in the wrong direction to convey this strongly held feeling. And as time went on, even Lewis himself would begin to share this sentiment about the film even going as far as to say that he was ashamed of his work. All this time later though, interest in the project didn't die. It only grew over time, becoming one of the most desired lost films ever made, especially from this time period due to all the controversy and history that surrounded it. However, in 2004, Joan O'Brien would pass away, leaving Lewis the ability to publish the film if he desired to do so, but he refused. Even after being asked many times on multiple occasions, he consistently refused. So, what do we have? Over the years, there have been production materials that have surfaced online. Namely, many screenshots from the rough cut of the film, and even photos of the filming set. But the most interesting pieces of content from the film that were revealed were an early draft from the 1971 script, and a documentary that showed the production behind the film during its shoots in 1972, which actually did include full scenes from the film, one of which is said to be in the final cut. But the story doesn't end here. So where can we go from here? I mean, we know that the movie exists, but the man who made it doesn't want it to be released, so that's the end of it, right? Well, we do have the script, and while it might be an early draft, it still most likely contains a lot of scenes and elements that were present in the final product, but I didn't read it. I couldn't spoil it for myself, because it is most likely going to be released, most likely sometime during or after 2024. But how do we know that? How did we get here? Over many years throughout the rest of his life, Jerry Lewis was asked about the film and if he would ever release it, although he would always vehemently shoot down all of these offers, even stating in 2013 when asked about it that it would never release. However, there was still hope. A year earlier, a French film director by the name of Xavier Giannoli revealed that he actually had a copy of the film albeit an incomplete one that was an hour and 15 minutes long, and even said that he had held private screenings of it. He even showed the film to famous French film critic Jean-Michel Fordin, who would write about it in his book, The Last Laugh, Strange Humors of Cinema. Surprisingly, he argued that the film had a quote, great power about it, 
and praised it for not taking the expected approach of having a respectful perspective of such dark and tragic material. Although many others that had seen the film through these screenings would disagree for the most part. Still, no footage would ever come of this. However, three years later, the biggest break in the search yet would become a reality. Although it was in less than ideal circumstances, to say the least. In 2015, it was reported by the LA Times that Lewis donated a copy of the film to the Library of Congress, but with a condition, which was that the film will not be shown for at least 10 years. So the film would most likely end up being released, although at the earliest it would still take 10 years. But only a year after this announcement, even more about the film was revealed. On a German TV channel called ARD, on February 3rd, 2016, a documentary was aired called Der Clown, which showed interviews with cast members, footage from the original shoots, and even reenacted scenes from the scripts, even including an interview with Lewis himself about the film. And in June of that same year, there would be another big break. About 30 minutes of footage was uploaded to Vimeo that included clips from the German documentary, and even clips from the film itself. This is the most footage that we have from the film, Despite the negative reception the film received back in the 1970s, some who have seen these clips from the film, as well as the reenactments from the documentary, have come to praise the film for being ahead of its time. But that's where the story ends for now. But of course it's still ongoing, 49 years later. We simply just have to wait until 2024 or maybe later to experience this lost film. Whether it's good or bad or distasteful, or if it really is a work ahead of its time, as some have claimed. No matter what the consensus is, it deserves to be seen after all this time, and hopefully it will be. The Library of Congress has even gone on to say that it intends on eventually screening it at their audiovisual conservation campus located in Culpeper, Virginia, although they have no intent on loaning the film to other institutes. So a home media release of the film for now is unlikely. So I guess, with this film, only time will tell.